This episode is sponsored by Dashlane. Every time somebody discovers something new and wondrous, someone else finds a way to use it to attack or exploit others. Fortunately, other folks find ways to foil those attacks, eventually. So today we'll be looking at cyber security, the basic concepts and current challenges, and some of the challenges we'll face further down the road. One of the biggest challenges right now with cybersecurity isn't that we don't have a lot of the tools, but that most folks don't actually know they exist or what the threats look like. As is often the case with any field, especially science and technology, there's a lot of specialized terminology that develops that can add a certain layer of the arcane when folks outside the field try to understand it, so we'll spend some time today discussing some of the terms and giving some plain English explanations and analogies. Now, sometimes techno-speak is unavoidable as you have a concept that doesn't really exist outside a field or using an existing parallel term might cause confusion. However, often it is an example of what Mark Twain's criticism of using $5 words when 50 cent ones will do, and I try to avoid doing that on this show unless the 50 cent word has the letter R in it. A silver lining of having a speech impediment, it is already so hard for folks to understand what you're saying that you have little temptation to use obscure language to worsen the situation. On the other hand, I suspect it makes me prone to giving longer and more detailed explanations of things, explaining why our episodes here are often rather long, and why you probably want to get a drink and a snack before settling in to watch one. I've generally been involved in technology my whole life, but took a more detailed interest in cybersecurity recently in a rather involuntary fashion, as I suspect is true of a lot of folks. Something happened and suddenly you need to know and are confronted by lots of complex new ideas and terms. That might have been getting your account somewhere hacked or your company feeling it needed to add new security protocols, and of course those are useless if everyone doesn't know what they are and how to use them quickly and easily. No security is ever airtight, but no security is ever even useful if it takes so much training to use and effort to employ on a day to day basis that it's impractical, like having 40 locks on your front door, you spend so much time unlocking them that you don't have any time to use your home. In my own case it was the 2016 US elections, though it's been a growing concern in managing elections for a while now and it seemed appropriate to do this episode in an election week. For those who didn't know, one of my other hats outside this channel is overseeing elections for my area, and obviously there were concerns about election security and also concerns about those concerns, so we had to spend a lot of time working with the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the Secretary of State, and various other public and private groups upgrading and improving both electronic and physical security. There's an awful lot of overlap between those incidentally, and since we tend to be more familiar with physical security, I'll often use those for our analogies to cybersecurity, and we might as well start with multi-factor authentication or MFA. Now you've probably heard this term, though we often refer to just two-factor authentication, the simplest kind, which would be where you need more than one thing to gain access to something, like your computer. Emphasis on more than one thing because having two locks on your door is not an example of multi-factor authentication, that's the same factor, you've just got two of them. Two is better than one to be sure, but often not by much. If someone can pick door locks they can pick two of them, if a pickpocket steals your keychain they've got both keys. We usually consider there to be three types of factors, knowledge, possession, and adherence, and multi-factor would use multiple of those rather than multiple of the same kind, with two-factor using two kinds. Knowledge is something only you know, your password or PIN code or where you store your spare keys, again it's something you know. Possession would be something only you have access to, which would be your keys or your bank card or an ID bracelet or token, something you have or possess. Inherence is something inherent to you, like your appearance or fingerprint or retinal scan or unique voice characteristics. Your signature is an old school example, though for something like a numbered bank account, 
one where the account is anonymous of name and just has a number, they might have someone write down that number or some word so they can identify the handwriting as matching, like a signature. Needless to say, you can have some overlap. A photo ID is arguably a possession, but it's your unique face and inherent factor that is critical, though you might put a photo on a credit card or a security badge which also has a PIN number only you know. Now to use that someone needs all three factors, knowledge of the PIN code, possession of the card, and the inherence of your face. That would be three factor authentication, same if the photo was absent but use your signature instead. A classic credit card you just need to swipe and sign for it is two factor authentication, possession of the card plus the inherence of your signature. A debit card where you enter the PIN is also two factor, again possession of the card plus knowledge of the PIN code. Alternatively, if you just have to enter the card number, something you know, and a PIN, something you also know, that is single factor, just multiple instances of that factor like having two keys. Incidentally, having two people each with a key to a different lock, or each with a different PIN code, both of which must be used in tandem, is called the two-man rule, and represents a different kind of security, since it's security focused on making sure an authorized user isn't misusing whatever is locked up by requiring two authorized users to be present. We use those on nuclear weapons, mini bank vaults, and at my office for handling ballots and other critical election materials. Another critical concept of security, since often you're just as worried about inside jobs as outside ones. In a more modern context, your smartphone will usually have an option for a PIN code, something you know, and a fingerprint scanner or face or retina scanner, things which are inherent, and of course you have to possess the phone to use it. That gives you the option for all three factors, but in practice you'd enable it so you only needed two since it's rather inconvenient to punch in a PIN code with one hand while scanning the other when you want to apply to a text message. Convenience matters for security, both to be able to use the thing effectively and to prevent convenience-based security holes, like giving people really bizarre computer passwords they feel obliged to write down on a 3M post-it and stick in their desk, ensuring that a hacker really only needs to hunt around for a piece of paper with gibberish written on it and usually not hunt much since it's probably stuck to their monitor. Physical security is a major part of cybersecurity, since someone can break into your office to see that password, but they don't necessarily need to, since folks often take selfies at work with their gibberish password cheat sheet in plain view in the photo. Note of course that all of these can be broken and there are various levels of security, this is just the types. Same as a cheap small lock on a desk drawer can be easily broken compared to a giant bank vault door, even though both are physical locks and barriers. The general notion is that there is an effort required to break a given type of factor, and that's usually harder to do for two factors than for two instances of the same factor. Again a lock picker can pick two locks without much additional effort training your steps in their plan, compared to someone who needs to know how to pick a lock and sit somewhere nearby with binoculars waiting to see you punch in your door's PIN code. Extra instances of the same type can be very handy, two locks on a door means more time unlocking them and risking being caught, having a lock on your front door and on your office door also adds that time element and surprise since a thief or hacker might not know of that second lock, but they still have the skill set and tools to break it since they broke the first one so you are either using a very different type of lock or factor which they might not be practiced in foiling, or use a different factor like a fingerprint scanner. It's hard to be an expert at everything, and using a team of experts, especially for something criminal, exposes them to vastly higher odds of something going wrong, even if just because the more people who know of a secret or secret plan, the more likely that secret gets out or exposed. There's pretty much always going to be a trick to foil any specific type of authentication factor, but usually a lot of effort or precision is involved and skills or circumstances needed, so multiple factors, even simpler ones, are often handy. An example of that might be a brute force attack. 
In physical security terms, that would be kicking in someone's door or trying every combination on their bike lock rather than stealing the key, picking the lock, or tricking someone into giving it to you, a cybersecurity equivalent of which is called phishing and which we'll come back to. In encryption terms, it's busting through a password or PIN code by trying every single option until you get the right one. A 4 digit PIN code has 10,000 possible combinations, and someone would need to try every single one by hand which takes a lot of time. We can further mess with that by limiting it to so many tries, usually 3, before the system locks out for a set period of time. We can toss in duress codes, something someone could punch in to access the system while at gunpoint while loading authorities, but which a random attempt at hacking is just as likely to trigger as the right code, or more likely if you have several. On the flip side, someone can guess which four digits are being used by looking at which buttons are worn down or have fingerprint smears on them, and so instead of guessing 10 to the 4th combinations, 10,000, they only have to guess 4 to the 4 combinations, a mere 256. Still not great odds, 3 tries on 256 options or 1.1%, though if you're a random thief walking through a bunch of pin-coded storage lockers, and there's hundreds of them, you are going to get into one. When we're talking about analogies in cybersecurity, a lot of times those are great odds because if you had a list of a million bank account numbers, and a computer doing the random guessing, you don't really care if you screw up 99% of the time, or even 99.99% of the time, since even in that case you gained access to a hundred bank accounts. You can of course fight a brute force attack by adding more digits, but you can also do it by adding more characters, hence all those password rules about using a mix of capital and lowercase letters and numbers and special characters like an exclamation point. Someone wanting to brute force a 6 digit PIN code has a million options instead of 10,000 with 4 digits, but a letter only 4 digit code has 26 lower and 26 uppercase options for each digit, 52, so 4 of those is 52 to the 4th power, 7,311,616, more than 7 times the amount the 6 digit pin had, and 731 times what the 4 digit had. It's even more if we add in numbers 0 to 9, 62, and a 62 character 6 digit code, which is considered weak, has 57 billion options. Incidentally meaning if you took about 3 seconds to manually enter each one, you would get 10 million done in a year without rest or sleep, and while on average you get the right combo halfway through, they might need potentially 5700 years to crack it, around as long as we've had letters and numbers. Needless to say, it's weak against a computer doing it, and they could potentially get around features limiting your tries, like that 3 strike rule, by making a copy of the system and hacking that, failing, making another and trying again and again and again. The other way around that is being clever, since by default most people will have used an entirely lowercase password, and probably an actual word, so it will try all of those first. Smart folks would use more complex ones, but sites force people to because they look bad if they get hacked regardless of who screwed up the security. Of course you need a password reset mechanism as well, and those can be backdoors to hacking and also hacking a database containing millions of passwords and selling those on the dark web is common as well. You've also got the backdoor of malware someone downloads and doesn't have to hack your password, it just has to record what you type and transmit that. Moreover, if you've got 10 authorized users on your system, you don't really care who screwed up by using a weak password just that some hacker got in and changed all the passwords and sends you a ransom demand. Any authorized account, even a low privilege one, is better than nothing for a hacker as it offers a larger attack surface, more directions or vectors to strike from to find a weakness. This same approach gets used in social media too, target a weakly secured user, hack them, and send an innocuous file to their friends containing malware. That's also a good reason to do backups that aren't connected to a network, since it means that while they can still threaten you with exposure of private data, they lose the ability to threaten you with deletion of data, and that's a very common security measure of municipal governments who aren't keeping anything ultra-private but need that data, 
like phone numbers and addresses of their citizens, so they can respond to emergency calls. Quick note though, no password is any good if people forget it, and while a hacker can't usually sneak into someone's office to see where they wrote down their random gibberish password, it is often recommended you just use something long but easy to remember, instead of short random gibberish, like the names of all four of your grandparents, capitalizing the first letter of each name, and picking a random special character to act as your space, though don't use the space bar as that's the most common special character used in passwords, followed by an exclamation point. Brute Force is rarely entirely random and tries the obvious stuff first, same as if you had a 9 digit pin code on devices, they try your social security number out first since it has 9 numbers and everyone memorizes theirs. Length has a value all its own though, and 10 random but hard to remember special characters is more of a pain to use than typing out a set sentence that is twice as long, especially if you're interrupting the letters with some chosen special character. Before anyone writes me an angry note, no, you wouldn't want to use your grandparent's name in favor of some fairly obscure phrase you can easily remember, but it's a good lead-in to talk about data mining and phishing. It's pretty common for password resets to require answering security questions like where you were born, what your pet's name is, and where you went to school. Go on someone's Facebook page and you can probably see where they were born, went to school, and a bunch of photos with their pet and comments about how much they love their cat mittens. And remember our early remarks about trying random pin code storage lockers or bank accounts? Most hackers looking to make money do not care who they are making it off of, they go for low hanging fruit and raw quantity, and they can write code to harvest thousands of random accounts for such data. They also don't need to bust through all the extra measures of more secure places like a bank, because most folks use the same username and password everywhere, and hacking the database of user accounts and passwords at some website forum for gardening enthusiasts probably got you a ton of those, and if you are using some gibberish password for everything because it's more secure, and you just memorize that one gibberish sequence to use everywhere, you are liable to get hacked. That's why it's a big deal when some big website gets its username and password stolen even though there's nothing on there financial, just a bunch of dating profiles, which also probably contain you talking about where you were born, went to school, and how much you love your cat mittens. It's probably a silver lining against hacking that people lie on their dating profiles so much. Of course you can protect yourself against random folks looking at your Facebook profile to harvest your data by making your profile private, but many folks are prone to accepting friend requests from random strangers, which can easily be someone wanting such info, and takes us to phishing. Now phishing itself is more active, and is an attempt to gain sensitive information by disguising yourself as someone trustworthy or innocuous and comes in a lot of forms, but there are some major types we'll detail in a moment. This is generally going to involve bait. For instance, I might run a sweepstakes where the winner gets $100,000, but to enter you had to make a free account and enter your name and address and phone number, and bank account and routing number so they could send you the money if you won. They might even give an apparent ulterior motive to allay suspicions, like saying how you had to sign up for their newsletter so it looks a tricky but mundane attempt at marketing. Odds are pretty good a ton of folks will use the same username and password they use for everything, and if we're going to be cynical but realistic here, it's probably disproportionately likely someone lured by apparently free money also isn't practicing good password hygiene either. Other methods would be something like buying the domain name for something trusted, or rather something real close and legit sounding, like AmazonCustomers.com and sending folks urgent messages like, we are worried your account may have been hacked, please click this link to reset your password. You click that link in a hurry, get there, and enter your username and password, and the fake site logs in for you on the real site and orders some stuff. Pretending to be tech support is pretty common, the physical equivalent of sneaking into a place by pretending to be a repairman. Also, targeting older folks way less familiar with modern technology is common, and using any sort of bait that is both urgent and likely to distract and upset the target, akin to calling someone on the phone at 3am and telling them their grandkid is in the hospital, as a way of grabbing important information or breaking into their home while they rush out. 
There's also physical methods too. Besides just lockpicking, you've also got dumpster diving, regularly employed by both law enforcement, white hat hackers, and criminal black hat hackers. The former also generally has access to way more personal information on you, though the amount of personal info available online about most people is often rather shocking. Either sort, white or black hat, can apply infiltration or coercion methods, though these would generally look different, but an example of infiltration would be a room only a few folks were authorized to enter, plus the cleaning service. Good example of future threats too, a company might replace their janitors with robots, and someone might hack those robots or sneak a camera in on them. Needless to say, this is why multi-factor authentication is handy, and why sites like to send you a security code on your phone if they see you log in from a different IP address than normal. It's not foolproof, nothing is, but it protects you and more to the point, scammers usually don't care who they rip off so they go for the easy targets. Though if almost everyone is using good security, it's hard to find any easy targets, scammers can't make money that way anymore. Of course sometimes they do care who they target. Spear phishing is an example of when an individual or individuals are being personally targeted, like trying to hack employees of a company because they might use the same password there as for all their personal stuff. Whaling is a subtype where you go after a big target, like the CEO or director specifically. Frequently these won't be aiming for direct monetary gain either so could be less obvious, in the case of politically motivated hackers. Obviously we can't get through all the terms today, and I still want to get to the further and the future concerns, so we focused on the major ones and the general idea that most of these do have mundane examples or parallels and you can find more plain English explanations. I'd also really suggest folks in IT, of which we have plenty here in the audience I imagine, work hard to try to go for those simple explanations and analogies to laymen. The other half of knowing any field is knowing how to explain it, and you have a lot less running around to do if everyone in your office is mystified by this stuff. Another thing to emphasize is that, as is often the case with technological concepts we look at here, Hollywood and TV is not a great source of info, nor are panic inducing articles on the web. A lot of folks don't get knowledgeable about employing even basic security because they figure some hacker can get them if they want to bad enough. And that's arguably true, but it's like not locking your front door on the premise that someone can always stick a gun to your head and make you open it. You generally can't just sit down at a computer and whack a few keys and get into a system like in a TV show, or guess the password as a pet's name or birthday, especially if they put even a tiny variation into that as it explodes the possible options. Like all security, more is better and nothing is perfect, you just want to aim to be too much effort to be worth attacking. Going back to multi-factor authentication, knowledge, possession, and adherence, something you know, something you have, and something you are, any security option that requires a possession as a factor, something you have, makes it real hard to do remote hacking even on a real simple password, something you know, because they need both. On the flip side, losing or damaging a possession can permanently lock you out of your own accounts, similar to losing the keys to your car and being unable to get a key copy made. Having backup copies of that key exposes you to additional security risks too. That's also why biometrics or implanted chips, barcode tattoos, or tamper-proof data bracelets are handy, you can lose them, and we're likely to see those get more common. Of course one has to worry about a hacker getting rather literal and lopping something off or out of your body, but you are already subject to physical coercion as a security workaround anyway like getting mugged at an ATM, and again you would want more than one factor, thumbprint or biochip plus a PIN code for instance. So even some amazing quantum computer that can hack any code, which gets rather exaggerated, see the quantum computers episode for details, can't get someone into something if it also requires a possession like a thumb drive with a long encryption key on it that has to be plugged in. It's like the AI boogeyman of some computer intelligence that can't be kept chained up and can get through every firewall. We also have air walls or air gaps, computers that aren't on a network, 
and which you have to physically go plug something into to access. It doesn't matter how smart the AI is, if it's stuck in such a thing it isn't hacking its way out. Though it might employ trickery of other types, and that's how a lot of modern hacking works, not by random brute force, but by getting people to give up critical information, which is again why you don't limit your security to just something you know. Now for something you are, inherence factors, like your fingerprint or face or voice or retina, those can be mimicked, especially if the scanner has a low resolution or margin for error to be used effectively. You don't have to chop off someone's finger or gouge out an eyeball, just lift it off anything they've touched or from a photo, which is preferable anyway since you generally prefer nobody knows you even got into a system. Mimicking such a thing is hardly easy, especially since they would tend to require specialized equipment with long supply chains that can be secured themselves. You probably would have a hard time getting a finger duplicator that scans a fingerprint and mimics it at really high resolution and potentially the right temperature. Public sale of such a thing would probably be illegal and the device is secured, and it might be unrealistic to think a black market could have a big supply, since complex manufacturing chains are hard to replicate in some basement. But we can't rule such things out, especially in a world of ever-improving 3D printers. Show me a biometric signature and we can figure out a way to grab it rather covertly and mimic it, though constant improvements in their resolution making it harder to mimic might minimize that or even make it impractical. So what are some alternatives? A couple weeks back we were discussing mind-machine interfaces, MMIs, reading brainwaves non-invasively, or actually plugging wires into someone's head. Of course a big concern for that is getting hacked, and while fiction covering that is usually rather vague about how you'd actually do that, it is presumably possible. Though I'd imagine a lot of the same security measures we already discussed could apply there too. It also offers a great option for biometrics, namely your brain waves, which generally do not stick to every object you touch like your fingerprint does and are likely to be harder to get and mimic than things outwardly visible. What's more, MMI offers us an option for rapid and easy use of one of the best cryptography methods, namely the one-time pad, as a good neural interface with storage could keep long one-time pads on it and usable in an instant. A one-time pad is a very long encryption key that is used only once to encode and then decode it using a copy of the pad at the destination. One-time pads are usually called perfect ciphers, as they just don't offer any route to decrypt them even with infinite processing power available if you don't have that key. It's effectively like the Library of Babel we discussed in the episode Things Which Will Never Exist. It's just random gibberish and so you can decode it, but literally into any possible text combination of that length. An infinite number of monkeys on keyboards will eventually type out a copy of Shakespeare, but they'll also type out a ton of gibberish and every other book too, and that's what you're effectively decrypting with a one-time pad. Everything. And you have no idea which copy was right, hence nothing for a quantum computer solve for either. The problem is, your one-time pad has to be as long as your message, and you need a copy at the origin and destination, so they're quite a pain to use and all vulnerable if the one-time pad was not generated truly randomly, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Assuming you do, a one-time pad is unhackable unless you have that pad, period, even against quantum cryptography. Though again, so long as that pad is genuinely random, which quantum key generation should permit, basically the same tech that permits quantum computers to hack encryption, also offers a method for generating truly random one-time pads immune to such hacking. That will be very important to any interplanetary or interstellar civilization, since if they want to move data at light speed, not on hard drives on some ship, they will have to transmit it, and even lasers spread out over distance, so trying to keep someone from getting a little eavesdropper in along that transmission path over vast gulfs of space is probably not too practical. Though quantum encryption might let us get around this as you destroy the message and alert the recipient if you eavesdrop on it. Though this brings up its own problems. As an example, a message no one can crack is great, but if your transmission is easily interrupted so you can't get it either, 
your secrets are safe, but your ability to communicate is disrupted. Another reminder that too much security can be an issue too. Public Wi-Fi for instance is an invaluable boon nowadays as it allows folks to do business on high bandwidth while mobile, but comes with heightened security issues as it leaves you vulnerable to man-in-the-middle or MITM attacks, since anyone who's hacked that Wi-Fi spot or put up a fake one can copy or alter the data you're sending. Getting back to MMI, if you've got a little chip in your brain with a trillion random digits on it matched to another such unique pad elsewhere, that is not getting hacked while that data is in transit. Data in transit, by the way, is the term for when data is moving from one place to another, and its direct analogy would be an armored car carrying cash from a store's money safe to a bank vault. A great password and physical security system at home and the office doesn't help much if you carry your personal files around unencrypted on a thumb drive, or on your phone and you shut off the security features because they make it a pain to text while driving. A lot of cloud computing encrypts the data in transit but not at the end points, though they might encrypt it on their servers or you could send it already encrypted so what arrived was. That obviously doesn't help much if you remotely access everything on all your devices and someone just has to steal your phone, but anybody providing you cloud storage can't really help that you leave your stuff logged in and unsecured. They might encrypt on their side too, but of course they have the key for their own encryption so there's a trust factor there and of course even if they're trustworthy, a given employee might not be, or might be coerced into giving that key up. That's obviously a big concern in any sort of probably not too distant future where folks might keep backup copies of their brain digitally stored somewhere. Someone grabs a copy of that and now they have your brain and can copy it. The counter to something like that would be encryption before transmitting where the key is stored elsewhere, and again that might be some incredibly long one-time pad. Needless to say, while we normally only think of having two copies of a one-time pad, as it minimizes security risks, you can have more, so if you're storing the lone copy of someone's brain encrypted via a one-time pad, you might have that pad stored elsewhere, and possibly a few elsewhere in case it gets corrupted or blown up. That pad still has to be made somewhere, along with at least one other copy, and moved to a destination, though quantum key distribution might get around that. Still, two places that need to talk a lot can generate really long one-time pads, or many of them, and use them till they run out and just ship in others to be used at agreed upon times. So this allows secure light speed communication, and there's probably nothing stopping you from sending pads of quintillions of bits along with your initial colony ship, and occasional new ones to replace used up ones, or to prevent long silences while you ship out new ones if the ones there got seized or destroyed and the vulnerability of such things is the same as any authentication factor of the possession type, someone can steal it. Once again while multi-factor authentication is good, and while physical security is a very real and necessary component of cybersecurity. So the bad news is that cybersecurity is here to stay, and you really do need to get yourself acquainted with it and practice it properly. The good news is that it's not some arcane process you need to be an expert at in order to be secure yourself, and I hope we've demystified it a bit today. Obviously we couldn't cover everything, even for the basics, but our goal was as much to make it clear that it doesn't have to be a scary boogeyman requiring years of education to understand as to explain it all. Important things to do to be pretty secure pretty fast is to enable two-factor or multi-factor authentication wherever that's an option. Always eyeball any email with attachments or asking for information to see if the address is really coming from a trusted source or just something that looks like it, and to avoid using identical passwords everywhere. You can do that last all on your own, but there are tools that help, and one of those is Dashlane. It's a password manager and one that can not only save all your passwords, but can rapidly generate long secure passwords for you too, and even be set to automatically change them periodically. You have a master password that's never transmitted over the internet, not even to Dashlane, but it can still transmit all those passwords encrypted to your other devices you've installed it on, so you have access there so long as you don't lose your master password 
as again, they don't keep a copy, but since it's only on those devices you installed it on, nobody can hack it from afar, and you can keep it simple if you like. That means if Dashlane gets hacked, all they would get is bundles of encrypted data that wouldn't mean anything without the unique master password for each and every individual Dashlane user. By the way that's over 13 million users, meaning 13 million unique master passwords. This is not worth a hacker's time. Though Dashlane does have the option for two-factor authentication if you want some extra security on your mobile devices. Dashlane also provides easy to use and secure autofill options so you can keep all your addresses, phone numbers, credit card numbers, and personal data there to autofill on forms, and has a built-in VPN, Virtual Private Network, so you can surf the net securely even on public Wi-Fi systems. They also provide dark web monitoring to warn you if any of the places you have accounts have been hacked and the data stored on the dark web. That's Password Manager, VPN, and Dark Web Monitoring, and they do all that for less than what just one of those services usually costs. If you'd like to give Dashlane a try, use the link in the video description, dashlane.com slash IsaacArthur, and get a free 30-day trial of Dashlane Premium, and you can also use the coupon code IsaacArthur to get 10% off if you decide you like it. Today we focus mostly on the near-term practical future, So next week we'll jump back to the far future and look at spaceship design, and the ships we'll need to get out and colonize the galaxy. The week after that, it's back to the Fermi Paradox Great Filter series to look at what barriers, like interstellar travel or self-destruction, might keep us or other civilizations who've reached our technological state from colonizing the galaxy. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. And if you'd like to support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or on our website, IsaacArthur.net, linked in the video description below. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great and secure week.